Hey, it's Ray, and the Port of Indecision today is at the Tower of London. In the background, you see the Tower Bridge. The Tower of London is, is over my shoulder now, and we're gonna to be touring this building that was uh, basically a fortress. It's now dwarfed by the skyline behind me. We sail from the Port of Indecision. First things first, I'm introduce myself. My name is Yeoman Ward, I'm at Prime, and I'm one of the 33 Yeoman Warders that lives and works here at the Tower. Our story here starts way back in the year 1066, when William the Duke of Normandy, William the Conqueror, defeats Anglo Saxon King Harold at the Battle of Hastings. Now, he's a cheeky fellow, he's got the temerity to declare himself King William the I of England on Christmas Day of that very year, but he's got a problem on his hands. It's massive. The people of England, the Anglo Saxons, they don't like it. In fact, they hate him. So they keep rebelling against him, so they're up and down, up and down, the country putting down rebellion. He's fed up a bit, so he does a terrible thing. He goes to the north of England, carries out what is known as the harrying of the north. He kills thousands and thousands of Englishmen, and he wipes hundreds of villages off the map. He comes back down here to the south of England. He doesn't want to harry the south of England for two reasons. One, all the money and commerce is based here in the south. Second, or obvious reason, is that the people in the south of England, they're a lot nicer, aren't they, than the people from the north. <laughs> so he means that that's controversial, I admit that. So he decides he's going to impress them overall, citizens of London to do that. He builds his first royal palace and fortress. It's right in the middle, and we're going to have a perfect view of it a little bit later on in the tour. Over the next 200 years, this place gets bigger and bigger. In 1220, they built 13 towers in a circle and they join them up with a wall which we call the inner wall because in 1280 six more towers two gun emplacements and another wall that's the wall you see there the outer wall then they build a moat that works for 500 years by 1843 it's become stagnant so it's drained and hundreds of tons of sand and shingle are poured into it to bring it up to this level this place has been used for many many things over those hundreds of years it was a secure storeroom the crown jewels were, were moved here in 1303. Prior to 1303, they were kept in Westminster Abbey. They were looked after by some monks. In 1303, a plot was discovered. The monks were planning to sell off some of the jewels, steal them, sell them off. So the jewels were moved here, their safe keeping. And the abbot in charge, well, he was skinned alive and they nailed his skin to the door of Westminster Abbey as a warning. This was an armory, enough arms, armour and weapons here to equip an army of 100,000 men. This was the Royal Menagerie and Zoo. That's the King and Queen's personal collection of exotic animals and beasts. So here at the tower, we had lions, tigers, elephants, polar bears, brown bears, ostriches, wolves, monkeys, snakes, you name it, all kept here for the monarch's personal pleasure. Now some monarchs liked them more than others. Let's take James the First, a particularly odious little fella. He had a wooden platform built over there above the lion and tiger's cages. He'd entertain his friends to dinner while his servants would throw live cats and dogs over the walls into the lions and tigers. Terrible. By the 1800s, they started to monetize the animals. You could pay to come in and see them. They even had a little area where they were dressing monkeys in human clothing and you could go in, pay half a penny, and interact with them. It was hilarious. It was hilarious until a teenage chimpanzee bit the face off a young noble boy, and, and then it was obvious to everyone who wasn't here that this is a ridiculous place for wild animals. So in 1836, they were all moved away to Regent's Park, where they formed a brand new zoo, London Zoo, still there, of course, to this very day. But this place starts to become famous for something it was never ever designed for because it is a fortress. A fortress is simply a large building designed to stop all the horrible common people who live outside. There they are, over there. <laughs> <laughs> getting inside here. This was not designed to stop anyone getting outside. It's not a prison. Not designed as a prison, but it becomes a prison. It becomes the most famous prison complex in the whole world. And it was very handy for prisoners. Look to the top of the hill, you'll see a white building with elaborate statues on it. To the right of that, some trees. In the middle of the trees, there's a gap. That is Trinity Gardens on Tower Hill. That was the site of the very first official public execution site. So 
So between 1381 and 1747, 75 men of noble birth were to lose their heads up there by means of block and axe. Let's imagine the scene on a day of execution. London today is an amazing city, lots of things to do. That was not the case apparently in the 14th century. There was absolutely nothing at all to do. London Eye had not been built. <laughs> there was nothing on the television and nobody could read. So if you were a peasant, you just sat on the floor in your hovel, surrounded by your own filth, sticking away the foils and scabs, waiting to die of the plague. See, they're going to cut the head of a nobleman in public for free. That was brilliant. Like the World Cup final and the Super Bowl turned <laughs> into one massive event. So thousands would gather up there around a raised wooden platform known as the scaffold. They spend the morning drinking beer, getting excited, waiting for the main event to start. The main event would be a lord with his hands bound, brought along here by a showman warders. We would take him to the top of the hill, hand him over to the sheriff of London. There he would mount the scaffold steps paid executioner, say something witty to the crowd, and lie down with his neck on a block of oak. Signal we given, and down will come the axe. Hopefully, not always, but hopefully, beheading the fellow with one stroke. By law, the severed head had to be picked up and shown to the crowd. It was a legal proclamation. Behold the head of a traitor, so die all traitors, God save the king. Everyone will start cheering, chucking their hats up in the air because they all knew there was quite a fun, interactive bit coming up. Because the severed head was rammed onto a pike. A tall handled soldier's spear, which was hoisted aloft, carried through the streets of London with much merriment, all the children dancing around it, that way to London Bridge. London Bridge was the only bridge then in the city across the River Thames. There the head would be pulled off the pike and rammed onto a special set of spikes above the gateway entrance to the city. Now there's a warning. Now, we had to have a physical warning. Um, it's going to amaze, if anyone here under 20 will be amazed to know, in the 14th century, there was no social media. No, <laughs> no TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, any of that sort of thing. So you had to have a physical warning. So when you came here to London on your long weekend, pulling along, you stupid little suitcase on wheels, <laughs> you would look up, see a row, rotting heads dripping onto the pavement in front of you, realising, of course, we were operating zero tolerance policy for traders. <laughs> it is very efficient, I've looked into it, there is a 100% non-reoffending rate for people with their heads cut off. Now some people are lazy, that's human nature, they couldn't be bothered to follow the head, that was fine, they could have a little bit of fun at the top of the hill, headless bleeding corpse. The headless corpse was placed on a small open cart. That cart was pushed in and out of the crowd and the crowd were encouraged to press forward, dip their handkerchiefs into the blood. It was meant to bring you good luck and cure many illnesses. After extensive research it was found it did neither of those things. <laughs> the headless corpse came down the hill, it would come through the gates along Water Lane, and left the traitor's gate, go through the archway of the bloody tower, up the medieval steps, and be very, very quickly buried in an unmarked grave of the Chapel Royal St. Peter ad Vincula. On the tour today, in fact, we will follow exactly the same route as the headless bleeding corpse, and we will finish right next to where all the rotted bodies are buried. Let's treat that ready kiss. <laughs> now, when we move off, we normally just move off, but we are, we've got a new thing that a whole big thing that's been thought up by lots of managers. It's called Stirring Spirit for the Royal Standard. We've got to finish on a high to take people with us to the next block. So I've been working on mine. I'm quite pleased with it. I've never used up the public, um, but I am quite pleased with it. I'm going to use it now for the first time, but <clears throat> bear with me while I just mentally pair myself. Right. <laughs> Let's be heading off. <laughs> <laughs> it runs in a street called Mint Street, all the way around the other side, called Mint Street, very simply, because until 1810 the Royal Mint was just here. All coins of the realm were developed uh, here until 1810. In 1810 it got too big and it, it moved away. 
Many famous people have been part of the Mint. None more famous than the man who lived up there, those six windows there, the master of the Mint's apartment, and the most famous master of the Mint, that great British inventor and scientist, Sir Isaac Newton, lived up there. Don't know who Sir Isaac Newton no. is. Sir Isaac Newton, British scientist and inventor, invented gravity, um, <laughs> to the world, to welcome. Uh, before that, it's very hard to get any work done because everyone was just sort of floating around. <laughs> <laughs> Behind me is the Bell Tower, the strongest of all 13 on the inner wall. Now, normally I have a quiz for the kids, but unusual, and this has never happened. There's no children here at all, I don't think. So I'm going to open the quiz to everybody. Don't shout out, but put your hand up if you think you know why it's called the Bell Tower. Put your hand up if you think you know why it's called the Bell Tower. <coughs> yes, sir. Because it's a bell, it? Well done. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the top of there is a curfew. You thought it was a trick, didn't you? The top of there is a curfew and alarm bell. It is the only surviving medieval curfew and alarm bell left in the city of London. All of them destroyed in the Great Fire of London of 1666. It was rung every time of an execution. We still ring it every night now, but to tell our visits closing. But it was mainly used for curfew bell. Curfew is Norman French cover fire. And it was rung at night to tell people, guys, we live in a wooden city. Don't forget to put your fire out before you go to bed, unless you're going to burn the place down. Everyone did that religiously. 1666, put in lane, about 900 metres from here. Somebody forgot the Great Fire of London started. The fire went that way, the wind changed, it came this way. If it got to the Tower of London, we were in big trouble. Inside the Tower of London is one of Europe's largest stores of black gunpowder. If it gets here, half of southern England is going to blow up. So they start loading the gunpowder onto ships from the war. Fire's coming too quickly. So they come up with a genius plan. Thousands of men come and pick up barrels of gunpowder, and they cram thousands of barrels of gunpowder into all the houses that surround the tower. <laughs> On a given signal, all the houses are blown sky high. It creates a massive fire break. The wind changes, the fire cannot jump it, and the Tower of London is saved, and everyone rejoices. Well, not everybody. <laughs> not the people who lived in their houses. Some people are never, ever happy. Always moaning. On top of here, we've got, we've got the strong room. In the strong room, the most famous prisoner held there, the young princess Elizabeth Tudor, prisoned by her half-sister, Bloody Mary Tudor. Mary thought Elizabeth was part of a plot to stop her marrying Farmer King, Philip of Spain. She was innocent and she was released, but she was very cruelly banished from London and told she could never return. She did return, though. Three years later, from this very spot, she starts her own coronation procession. She goes from here to Westminster Abbey, where she is crowned Queen Elizabeth I of England. She rules this country for nearly 45 years. Imprisoned in the middle and behind me, two very famous men in prison at the same time, for the same crime, upstairs, Bishop John Fisher, behind me, the man for all seasons, Sir Thomas More. Now, Sir Thomas More is the second in command to Henry VIII. He's the Lord Chancellor, <coughs> very powerful position. <coughs> Henry VIII is having what we're going to call some marital problems. <laughs> he wants a divorce. He asks the Pope, but the Pope says no. He doesn't want to upset Roman Catholic Spain. So Henry VIII comes up with a plan that is absolute genius. He pulls away from the church in Rome, he names himself the head of the church in England, and he just signs his own divorce papers. What an excellent idea. That would have saved me £26,000. <laughs> That's a whole other story. Now, Henry needs all of his people to acknowledge him as the head of the church, so he plans to do this by getting all his lords and ministers to sign an oath. He asked them to sign it, and most of them sign it. It's not a great idea to upset Henry VIII. Two very brave men would not sign it. Bishop John Fisher to Thomas More. These are important people. The peasants are looking up to them. Henry needs them to sign. So he asks them to sign it, and they won't sign it. So then he orders them to sign it, and they still won't sign it. So then he pulls out of them, loses his temper, has them arrested. They're thrown into the Tower of London. They still will not sign it. Then he has them taken to the basement of the White Tower, where they are horribly tortured. They still will not sign it. Then he has them taken out to Tower Hill. Their heads are cut off in public. Too late then. <laughs> but even if they wanted to sign it, they couldn't. But for their bravery, 400 years later, both of these amazing men are canonised as saints of the Roman Catholic faith in 1935. And they are buried in the chapel where we finished this talk. Behind me, a very famous 
person held in practice. He's my favourite Duke. You know who I mean. He's your favourite Duke as well. It's James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth. <laughs> why I do this job. <laughs> okay, who's heard of the James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth? Nobody. Okay. Don't beat yourself up, guys. He is much more famous for his death than his life. He just happens to be the eldest of 14 illegitimate children of King Charles II, known for some reason as the Merry Monmouth. When he dies, 1685, next in line to the throne is his brother, another gentleman called James. Lots of people don't want this James to be king, not because they don't like him, lovely fella, because he's a Roman Catholic and they want a Protestant king. So they look around for someone to support and their eyes fall on James Scott. He's rich, he's handsome, he's got royal blood, he's Protestant, perfect. He is offered the throne, he says, that'd be lovely, thank you very much. And they raise a Protestant foreign army and it comes marching up the country towards London. It's all going ever so well until the 6th of July, 1685, at the Battle of Sedgemoor. His cavalry is split by some water from his army, and he is defeated. He runs off. Two weeks later, he is found hiding in a ditch. He's brought back to the tower, thrown into the cell behind me, found guilty of treason, sentenced to death, dragged up to Tower Hill, and executed. There's nothing unusual about that part of the story. However, his executioner is a giant of a man called Jack Ketch. Jack Ketch is not a full-time executioner. It's not enough full-time work. His full-time <laughs> job... He is a master butcher at Smithfield Meat Market next door. But he's a very enthusiastic, keen, amateur alcoholic. And he gets up nice and early, very professional on the day of execution. He has a couple of drinks to stiffen his resolve. And he dresses himself in a leather executioner's mask and a full-length leather apron. He has a couple of drinks to stiffen his resolve. And he starts to sharpen his huge executioner's woodsman's axe. After a couple of small drinks to stiffen his resolve, he jumps onto the circle line to Tower Hill. <laughs> he gets here, as he goes through the crowd, the crowd press upon him alcoholic drinks to stiffen his resolve. <laughs> By the time he gets to the scaffold, can barely mount the steps, because his resolve has become so stiff by this time. So he staggers up his steps, where he meets the Duke of Monmouth, and the Duke of Monmouth gives him a large bag of gold coins, very rich man. And he says to him, strike through, sir, strike true. Well, that happened today. The Duke of Monmouth's family, we've got one of them, no win, no fee lawyers on TV, and sued him because he did not strike true. One, two, three, four, five blows. The woodsman's axe, he still is not dead. One of his arms is hanging off. There's a large wound between his shoulder blades. Another wound goes through the back of his face, into the roof of his mouth, up into his nasal passage. This wound causes blood and air to spray on the crowd as he screams in pain. The crowd don't like it. They begin to boo. The ones at the front, they're all getting wet, aren't they? <laughs> Jack Ketch has had enough. He drops the axe, turns to the sheriff, and he says, I am done, sir. I can do no more. The sheriff says, Mr. Ketch, you finish this job or you'll be next. So Jack has a little rethink. He's not that drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and he drops to his knees. His left hand grabs the screaming lord by the hair. <coughs> and he slides his body along towards him. His right hand produces the butcher's carving knife. And he saws through the main and sinew by hand. Very unusual. You don't know why. The head and the body are brought back to the tower together. The head does not go to the bridge. They're taken to the vicar's house. I'll show you where it is later. They're put on the kitchen table and the two are sewn back together. And they're buried in the chapel. We know this is true. In 1876, we found his body in the chapel where we was having a bit of clear out. And we found <laughs> his head indeed has been sewn back on. He's reburied now right underneath the altar, underneath the golden cross. And we'll see that later when we finish the tour. Now, before we move off, we've, uh, we're, we're catching up. Although it's a very ancient building, we're a very modern workforce. We've been doing lots and lots of online training. I've learned a lot. I'm you know, older than a lot of people here. I've done GDPR. I know exactly what to do with your data. Um, I've done micro and maxi aggressions. I know how not to upset anybody by my, my language. And I've also done very interesting triggering. I didn't know what that was. That is telling stories or doing history that upsets people and, and makes them feel uncomfortable. Now, I've realised on that course, this 
it is a very triggering book. <laughs> I don't want anyone to be upset. So from now on, the rest of the tour, we do what we've done for hundreds of years here at the Tower, talk about execution, murder, prisoners. Or we could do something nice just for a change. We could spend the rest of the day talking about, I don't know, um, unicorns and kittens. <laughs> Who would like to vote for unicorns and kittens? Who votes for execution, murder, and prison? Yay! I'm fairly glad, actually. I didn't really think that through. I just thought, time, we've got 25 minutes left. I only know one unicorn and, and ten stories. It's about this magnificent unicorn <laughs> that trampled a kitten to death. Around here, have changed this country and they've changed the people we've become. Behind me is the famous Traitor's Gate, originally known as the Watergate, just used to bring in stores, gold bullion, soldiers, things like that, ordinary things. Its name was changed to the Traitor's Gate in the Tudor period because of the many, many traitors brought here straight from their trials up at the Palace of Westminster. Up there, they'd have been found guilty of treason and sentenced to death. They'd be loaded on a small open barge and rowed down the cold, dark waters of the Thames. People would gather on the side of the bridge to boo and jeer them. They'd get nervous. Just when they thought they couldn't get any more nervous, they'd be rowed through this dark tunnel, through these original gates, up the original steps to here, to be met by us yeoman warders. This, for me, and I hope for you guys, this is where history comes alive. Right where you're standing now, four queens of England have stood trembling with fear. One of them was lucky, Princess Elizabeth Tudor, who Elizabeth I lived a long life. Not so lucky, second wife of Henry VIII, Queen Anne Boleyn, dragged up these steps and taken away to her south. Then the fifth wife of Henry VIII, Queen Catherine Howard, dragged up here and imprisoned. Then poor Lady Jane Grey, young crowned child queen, bewildered young girl, dragged up here and thrown into her cell. Those three ladies, three queens of England, are still here in the tower. They're actually under the floor in the chapel, minus their heads. I'm going to show you where that happened. like all the other towers, it's not. Inside there is the King's audience chamber. In the audience chamber is what we call a day chapel. It's haunted by a, a man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do, I can tell you. <laughs> Inside there is a day chapel. It's a tiny chapel, only for room for one person to pray at a time. On the 21st of May, 1471, King Henry VI of England is kneeling at prayer in there. Very quietly, two knights come in, one smashes him on the back of the head with a spiked mace, while another one repeatedly stabs him in the kidneys with a dagger. The King of England is assassinated on that very spot. Move around further, you see the back of the bloody tower there, originally known as the Garden Tower. It overlooks a beautiful little garden. The name was changed by William Shakespeare during the reign of Elizabeth I to the Tower of Blood and then the Bloody Tower because of the many famous and terrible things that have happened in there. And there's none more famous, and there's none more terrible, than the disappearance and the murder of the two boy princes. Inside there, we're talking about two young boys. And it's the uncrowned King Edward V and his younger brother Richard, the Duke of York. They're only little, they're 12 and nine. When the 12 year old becomes king, after the death of their father, Edward IV, their kindly uncle, Richard the Duke of Gloucester, brings them back here to the tower separately by military means. Now he tells them he's going to look after them. He tells the eldest one he'll be what we call his Lord Protector. He'll help him rule the country, show him what to do, and when he's ready, step back and let him reign on his own. None of those things happen. He actually has them declared illegitimate by Parliament, and then he has himself crowned King Richard III of England. We're told those poor boys are stabbed and suffocated to death in that room. Moved the next day by a priest and buried under some stone stairs on the south side of the White Tower. They lay there under serve for 191 years. In 1674, the stairs are demolished and the workmen find a wooden chest, which they think is treasure. They rip open the top, rubbing their hands together. There's no treasure, of course, just the dusty bones 
of those two boys, 12 and 9. Charles II has them removed to a beautiful tomb called Innocent's Corner in Westminster Abbey. It's obviously there still to this very day. But if you look behind you, in the archway of the Bloody Tower there, you'll see a spiked Norman drop gate or portcullis. It is very simply a large, heavy metal tip gate designed to be let down at speed, to dig into the floor, to stop the enemy getting in during a siege. It's a marvel of medieval engineering, and it is totally original. 750 years old, wow. it's perfectly preserved, and it That's is in full working order. <laughs> it required 30 men to raise and lower it, and weigh two and a half tons. It's an amazing a bit of kit. Now we have to Okay, here we are in the inner ward or the centre of the Tower of London. Some of you may have spotted it, there it is. That's the original Tower of London, William's Norman Keep, built, would you believe, in the year 1078. But with one reason only, to impress and overall the citizens of London, that it would have done. The peasantry of London are living in one-storey Watland Dorp houses. That's 90 feet tall. All of our kings and queens lived in there for well over 500 years. They lived on the top floor there, away from the sights, sounds and smells of all the horrible <coughs> common people. The floors below, audience chambers, banqueting halls, accommodation for knights, ladies and bodyguards of the court. The bottom floor servants, retainers and kitchens, of course, everyone asks, yes, there was a basement, a dark and evil smelling place, lit only by the candles and the braziers of the torturers themselves. Inside there, people were crushed by the scavenger's daughter, ripped apart by the rack and hung up overnight by the wrists in sharpened metal manacles. This area here is Tower Green, the village green of the Tower of London. I live here, it's my village green, lived in a lot of villages in the UK, always had a green space, always had something cool on them, duck bong, cricket pitch, uh, children's play area. We've got nothing at all, little sign I suppose that says can't walk on the grass, very boring. <laughs> the only thing we do have I suppose is unusual, is we have a private royal execution site. <laughs> Don't get that little area mixed up with Tower Hill, 75 beheadings here six beheadings here, wow. three of them Queens of England. Talk about them now, it's 1536. It's everyone's favorite queen. It's the second wife of Henry VIII, Queen Anne Boleyn. She's been tried and found guilty on tripped up, made up charges. Incest, adultery, witchcraft. She's sentenced to death and imprisoned here at the tower. She is convinced though, that Henry VIII still loves her. So she bombards him with letters begging for his forgiveness. He ignores them all. Finally, she realizes she's got one last chance. She writes one more letter begging forgiveness. This time she puts in it a letter from her personal physician, her doctor. In it, he says, in his medical opinion, Anne Boleyn has developed what he calls a great fear. Nowadays, medically, we would call that a psychological fear. He says that Anne Boleyn has developed a psychological fear of the act. She's developed a psychological fear of having her head cut off with a massive axe. I don't think that's rare, because I've got that. <laughs> He's a lovely fella, Henry Day. He writes back and says, of course, my dear, I'm not going to go against medical opinion. I'll have your head cut off in the French manner with a sword. And that's what he does. Pays a very expensive French executioner to come from St. Omer by Calais. Scene is set, the lords are standing here, lords and ladies. Anne Boleyn's kneeling there. You kneel to have it cut off the sword, you lie down flat to have it cut off with an axe. The executioner's clever. He's hidden the sword behind him under some straw and sacking, but he says in a very clear voice, go and fetch my sword. The assistant walks down the steps, round the back of this crowd and disappears behind this chapel. Anne Boleyn, naturally, human nature, wants to see the sword. So she bends forward and looks left. This exposes the back of her neck. He silently takes out the sword, and in one glittering arc, the razor-sharp weapon takes her head clean off. It's a genius. Two diaries of the day tell us what happens next. The head spins around once. As it touches the floor, he grabs it by the hair and he picks it up. He's about to make the legal proclamation. Behold the head of a traitor. Before he can utter a word, two ladies hit the floor in a dead faint, and the crowd let out a huge gasp because we're told that Anne Boleyn's eyes are still looking around and her mouth is moving in silent prayer. She's been killed so quickly, so painlessly I like to think, thank God, that poor young woman did not even realise that she was dead. 
not quite so lucky, six years later, the axe falls twice here on the same day. This time it's the fifth wife of Henry VIII, Queen Catherine Howard, and her lady-in-waiting. Now, of all the executions I've had to study as part of my job, and there's quite a lot, there's no doubt in my mind that this execution is absolutely my favourite. <laughs> I love this execution, and it's not because I'm weird. <laughs> it's because this is a beautiful love story. Because she's been tried and found guilty on not trumped up charges. She's guilty. She's had an affair whilst married to Henry VIII. It's not a sordid affair. She does not love Henry VIII. It's a political marriage. He's 50, she's 18. Wow. The man she had the affair with is the love of her life, and she's the love of his. Beautiful. Of course, his name is a secret. We know it historically. His name was Sir Thomas Culpepper, and he worked at court. On the day of execution, the lords and ladies gather. She mounts the scaffold step. In her hand is a piece of paper. It's her goodbye speech. She couldn't be bothered to write it herself. It was written by her priest, and it's the shortest one possible. Three lines. Pray for my sins. Pray for my soul. Pray for the king. Before she can read those three lines, she glances at the crowd, and her heart nearly bursts out from her chest. There's a man standing there. His face is covered by a hood, but his eyes are locked upon her like a laser. Could that be the love of her life, Sir Thomas Culpepper, risking his life to say goodbye to the woman that he loved? She wasn't reading this rubbish. She drops the paper. She walks to the front of the scaffold. She raises her arms to the sky. She says, I die today the queen of all England. But would I be dying the wife of the only one man I've ever truly loved? And that's him there, Sir Thomas Culpepper. <laughs> Obviously, he's executed himself. Wow. <laughs> oh, Getting her own back, declaring her love, who knows? Down she goes, down comes the axe. Down comes the axe again. Then down comes the axe a third time. Took three goes to get through her slender neck. Her lady-in-waiting is technically luckier because her head is cut off in one stroke. Her crime, officially, is treason. She knew of the affair, had not told the king. I think her crime is loyalty to her mistress. A tragedy. Every execution is a tragedy, actually, because someone is killed.